Good afternoon. I'm Larry Jacobs. I'm a faculty member at the University of Minnesota at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Thank you for joining us for this series of online uh, conversations with uh, national politicians, state politicians, policy experts. It's good to have you with us. Um, and uh, this is part of a ongoing series that we've been running for some time, obviously before coronavirus it was uh, live and in person, um, but we're glad to have uh, so many of you with us. I uh, just wanna let you know that as part of our tradition uh, at the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the Humphrey School, we do welcome your questions. And you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's that little button there, Q and A. So feel free to, to uh, give us plenty of questions. Um, uh, we will incorporate as many as possible. I'm very excited today to have with us uh, Congressman Tom Emmer, who I've known more than a dozen years, I would say, going back to when you were just starting in the house and we, we did a few projects together um, and uh, it was thoroughly enjoyable um, and very uh, engaging. Um, Congressman Emmer was elected in 2015 to United States Congress represents the sixth congressional district in Minnesota, which is the northern and western suburbs, including St. Cloud. Uh, he is now chair of the National Republican uh, uh, Campaign Committee. Of, um, and in the ranking of leadership in the U.S. House of Representatives, this is the fourth senior, most senior position. And so therefore, uh, Congressman Emmer is the most prominent national Republican in Washington today. Um, and as you can see, he has had a rapid rise in national politics. Um, not a surprise to me, he's a very hard worker and as you will see today, uh, quite smart. Um, we're gonna cover a range of issues, uh, including um, uh, what's going on nationally, which we'll start with given uh, Congressman Emmer's role uh, as now the lead for the U.S. House Republicans in their effort to take back the majority. Uh, Congressman Emmer, thank you so much for joining us. Professor, it's always good to be with you. Although I'm, I'm longing for those days uh, where we can grab a cup of coffee at Keys and actually be sitting at the same table. Yeah, I'd look forward to that. Um, I have a feeling you're probably pretty busy these days. Uh, in which case, we're even more grateful that you took some time to visit with us. Let's start off with the Tulsa rally. I saw a nice picture of you there and the president gave you a really warm shout out at the uh, rally. How do you think the rally went? I think it went really well. It, uh, uh, it, uh, there was a ton of energy. I, I get a kick out of uh, some of the pictures since I was there. Uh, some of the pictures that I've seen that try to suggest that uh, nobody showed up. Uh, you basically have a building that holds about 19,000 people, and I wasn't taking tickets, uh, Professor, but uh, the entire lower bowl was full. Uh, if you take out the stage and the press, uh, you probably had a quarter of the floor filled, and then you had a smattering around the, uh, the upper bowl, which is probably about uh, maybe a quarter, maybe a quarter of the building, maybe close to a third. So. You know, I was sitting there thinking we got about ten to twelve thousand people that showed up, and the energy was uh, was pretty 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 dramatic. Uh, no matter what they did, though, Larry, once you announced that you had a million uh, RSVPs, I mean, if if you get uh, uh, eight hundred thousand people there, you uh, you were short. So, do you think that was a mistake for the campaign to come out and and kind of raise the bar? So it it almost invites the media to do the the gotcha game. Well, I, and I'd love to uh, play it myself, but I don't know ultimately who released it. Uh, if Brad Parscale released it, if it's something that just uh, organically uh, it got out because somebody was so excited about it. Uh, here's the, uh, the interesting thing. Uh, it had the highest uh, viewership in the history of, uh, of Fox. It had 7.7 .7 million viewers on, uh, on wow. a Saturday night. So... Uh, you know what? Uh, people who want to find uh, negatives can uh, spin it how they want to. I think at the end of the day, coming out of the coronavirus, uh, it was pretty significant. It was good event. Yeah. President said some things that uh, caught the eye of uh, political observers. And I think 
people in both parties. One was when he seemed to be downplaying the importance of doing testing for the coronavirus. What did you make of that? Oh, I, I think, uh, first off, I do not make it a practice of commenting on the president's comments. As you know, the president is a big boy. Uh, he's, he can defend himself. That's not my job. I'm elected to represent the state of Minnesota and the people in the state of Minnesota. It's how I act. It's, how, it's what I say and how I handle it. You know, uh, I don't think uh, it's uh, joking about uh, testing and, and the seriousness of the situation we're in uh, is something that I would do. I, I would, uh, you know, acknowledge, as I know uh, the president has, uh, this is a very serious thing. And he took very serious action. And, uh, you know, based on the numbers that our public health officials gave, uh, the dire predictions of the number of people that would die in this uh, pandemic, yeah, they apparently did the right things because uh, you didn't come anywhere close to those numbers. But I think uh, in time, as all Americans start to feel more comfortable in this uh, new environment, hopefully as a vaccine comes along, et cetera, then if your humor predisposes you to, uh, uh, you know, make references to uh, the, uh, you know, the COVID-19, uh, okay. Do you think the, uh, the number of tests is driving the number of positive results? Is that what's responsible for it? I, I'm, I'm, I'm a doctor of law. I am not a uh, virologist. I'm not a uh, epidemiologist. I, and I know that a lot of people like me who, who carry election certificates around suddenly become the most brilliant human beings that ever lived. Uh, I can't tell you that. My common sense would tell me that the more the testing is available, the more that we can test, uh, the more people that we're going to find that have had it, especially uh, since uh, you, you see that there's a vast majority of people who they get tested, they're told they've had it, and they don't even realize they had it. Yeah. They have the antibodies. So. Of course, we're seeing the, the number of positive results from those tests rising rapidly, particularly in the South, as well as California. Number of hospitalizations are up. Uh, place like Arizona, Texas, Florida, they're all seeing tremendous surges. Uh, and that doesn't appear to be related to increased testing. Uh, let me get back to the bread and butter for you, which is, um, which is the campaign. What's the strategy? Uh, you go back, you rerun the videotape. House Republicans had a majority for a while. They got clobbered in 2018, lost 42 seats. Now you step in, you've got kind of a fixer upper. Uh, what's the strategy for getting the majority back? I'm sorry. I love that. I, I have to go back. You, you understand, I wasn't telling you that I know testing is creating whatever, and I want to be care very careful about nobody going away from uh, this thing. I think the bottom line, Larry, is, you know, how many people are requiring hospitalization? How many people are requiring a, a really serious intensive care? Uh, you know, where are our numbers? Because the whole goal was not to overwhelm our healthcare system, and I don't care where you are. That should be our, our primary concern. Uh, well, I but, think... I think yeah. we all agree on that. Yeah. And I don't thanks. think there's a partisan issue there. And we're actually seeing in Texas, there's always a partisan issue, granted. <laughs> uh, but if you look in Texas and Florida, uh, you know, red states, uh, at least with the leadership, um, you know, they've been hit hard. You've got the governor in Texas, you know, appearing to warn citizens there, hey, we got to get a control over this because it's spinning out of control. And as you said, it may threaten our healthcare system. Yeah, well, and you got to remember that this uh, prolonged uh, shutdown creates other issues as well, right? Uh, uh, addiction, uh, substance abuse, uh, uh, suicides are up. Uh, we've got to be looking at the entire yeah. picture. You're so right. But it's one of the reasons I get along with you, because yes, it, it's, uh, everything has a partisan element to it, but we're supposed to be Americans. We're supposed to, we might have a viewpoint, but we're supposed to be figuring this out together and how we get to where we all ultimately want to be, which is let's make sure as many people uh, as we can uh, help and save, we do, and that we make it better for people going forward. I love the comment about, uh, I bought a fixer upper. The uh, Republican Party, I, I don't know that anybody's ever referred to it quite that way. <laughs> the... Uh, you're right. Uh, we lost uh, the majority in the fall of 2018. I I'm bullish on the uh, on uh, November of uh, 2020. 
Larry, I, I can get into a lot more detail. Uh, you're the guy asking the questions, uh, so I'll leave that to you, but I'll give you three things. You win with three things. You win with great candidates, and we have incredible candidates. In fact, after, uh, after today, the, uh, there are a handful of primaries today. One in particular is in New York. Uh, after the uh, primaries are closed today, I am confident that I will be able to say tomorrow morning, that we have a record number of women running for the U.S. House of Representatives as Republicans who will be on the general ballot. As of tomorrow, uh, we will have more than we've ever had in the past. And I believe it's approaching uh, 50 to 60 right now. We have a record number uh, that have run. Uh, we've had 226 women uh, file for office as Republicans across the country. We've had 190 minority candidates, and these are great candidates. Wes Hunt down in the Houston area is the H.W. Bush seat uh, from days past. Uh, this is a first-time candidate, uh, happens to be African-American, educated at West Point, uh, flew Apache helicopters, returned to where he grew up, Houston area, married, has a young daughter, and decided that he wasn't done serving his country and has been an awesome first-term candidate or first-time uh, candidate. Third thing is money. I'm sorry, second thing is, I left out, first thing is candidates, second thing is the environment. What's the environment gonna look like as we get to uh, November's uh, election on November 3rd? And third is money. And we're not gonna have as much money as the other side does. We just have to have enough money. So let's talk about environment. Uh, if you go back before February of 2020, you were a pretty confident guy. You said this was eminently doable to take back the majority. And the message was going to be the economy is is on fire and let's reelect uh, Republicans to office to continue that. And I think a lot of people around the country thought president had a good shot to get reelected. And there was certainly more than a shot for the uh, Republicans in the House to take back the majority. But since February, uh, the wheels have fallen, fallen off the, the jalopy and we've got, you know, extraordinary economic downturn. Uh, and even with the nice numbers uh, this past month, uh, unemployment is still 13%. Um, you've got uh, the coronavirus sweeping the country, and you've got a whole variety of fairly experienced political forecasters like Charlie Cook and uh, others saying that now the odds are in favor of the Democrats taking the majority. So how do you see the environment uh, playing in favor of your team. Yeah, I don't know that I'd buy that. That changes on a, on a uh, weekly, monthly basis, as you know. I mean, you study this thing all the time. Uh, I would say this to you. Uh, first off, two years ago, that's not what I heard. I told everybody it is incredibly doable. Uh, we can win back the majority, even though uh, history, I, you look back, history wasn't on our side going into 2018. I think the numbers, uh, uh, 23 or some incredible number, that uh, the party that loses the White House in the first midterm always loses a substantial number of seats. Uh, it might've been a little bit more than that. Uh, maybe it was 32 and we lost uh, 38, something like that. And they told me there would be no math. So you guys can check that later. But regardless, history was not with us last time. History shouldn't be with us this time, right? I think uh, when the Nixon's first midterm, I think the Republicans gained back 12 seats. You'll have to check my math. Uh, I, I think I'm close. Uh, and in, in uh, uh, Reagan's first midterm, I think it was 16. Uh, we now need 17 seats. Uh, and I, I will just tell you, uh, we can get into some of the details about the campaign and about uh, the presidential election, which I think is going to help us. Uh, and, and the economy, I think, is still going to be on the ballot. Uh, and if you look across, as you do, because you're the political scientist, you look at all these different uh, uh, polling things all the time. I had a national pollster tell me back in uh, early April, you can't believe the polls. People are not being forthright again. If they say anything about supporting a piece of the Trump agenda, if they say anything that they like something that Trump has done, they get eviscerated by their social groups. They get uh, absolutely crushed by family members, et cetera. And so they aren't saying it. They won't say it to pollsters. They won't say it where they're at. Uh, but if you look at a question that uh, is asked regularly across the country, Larry, that question is, who do you trust more to rebuild the U.S. economy, Donald J. Trump or Joe Biden? It favors Trump consistently throughout the pandemic. Uh, I think that's going to be beneficial. Plus, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out. 
Uh, we've won five special elections now. Uh, most recently, we won a seat in the California suburbs, the Los Angeles, California suburbs. It's the first time we flipped a Democrat seat in California since 1998. Hillary Clinton won this seat by seven points in 2016. Katie Hill won it by nine points in 2018. Mike Garcia, a first generation Hispanic American, he won it by 10 points uh, and had to do both a traditional campaign and a virtual campaign. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, if we're winning in the Los Angeles suburbs, we can win anywhere and everywhere we need to. In fact, there are now 43 Democrats sitting in seats that are better for Republican candidates, and we only need 17. Well, those are good points. Uh, of course, the uh, turnout for a special election is always lower. And Democrats make the argument that come 2020 in the fall, they'll have a higher turnout to win back uh, the this, this seat in LA. Uh, but let's go into some of the, the, um, the environment. The president is behind nationally and in um, most of the swing districts, swing states, um, nationally is behind by almost nine points, according to Real Clear Politics. And then you go through Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, even Ohio, and, and, and surprisingly, even Republican states like Georgia and Texas are pretty close, uh, toss-ups according to the polls. So that doesn't look so good. And we often see the president having a kind of impact on congressional races. Do you think the president is creating a drag on House Republicans? Not at all, not at all. By the way, these are the same polls that said Hillary Clinton was gonna win on a landslide, which is why I brought up, you gotta look at some of the underlying questions that I think are more indicative. Do they uh, seal the deal? No. Uh, and uh, I want, before we leave it, you're right about special elections, but I don't think people realize that when we had in-person voting in the March 3rd primary in this Los Angeles suburban seat, there were about 163,000 ballots cast. And yet when we had the all male balloting uh, that was done uh, on May 12th, it approached 175,000. And by the way, the Democrats brought in, uh, uh, what, not just Bernie Sanders to try and gin up uh, turnout. They brought in Hillary Clinton and they even brought out the great Barack Obama at the end, and it di didn't make a difference. So, uh, no, I don't think the president is acting as a drag on uh, the uh, our Republican candidates at all. In fact, I think uh, something that isn't talked about enough is the 8.5 million Trump voters that did not show up in the fall of 2018. They are going to show up this time. I can give you an example. Uh, the state of Iowa, we have a chance to win all four seats in the state of Iowa. And... Uh, it's because there's 165,000. I'm sorry, I got some activity going on behind me all of a sudden that I didn't expect. Uh, it's great working from home. The, uh, uh, we got 164, 165,000 votes total, Larry, in Iowa that did not show up in the fall of 2018 that will show up uh, in this, uh, in, in this uh, cycle. And in fact, uh, I think that's going to be very beneficial, not only to the president, but to uh, our Republican candidates. So let's go to another component of the environment that you see these forecasters looking at. Um, and it's a question you know well. Do you think the country's heading in the right direction or off on the wrong track? Um, and there's a two thirds or more of Americans, uh, according to Gallup, are saying we're off on the wrong track. And as you know, um, if you're in the incumbent party and voters are feeling, um, you know, dissatisfied with that incumbent party, it's an uphill battle. Yeah, well, again, the, uh, when you talk about the incumbent party, if you're talking about the president, that does have an impact. But I, in this environment, Larry, this is so, the, volat the volatility that we're seeing right now uh, whether it's governors, uh, whether it's state legislators, whether it's the uh, Congress uh, in the Senate races, this thing's going to move back and forth quite a bit. I think you got to look at some of the underlying indicators. And uh, I, I think uh, the problem that my colleagues in the House are going to have on the other side of the aisle is because when they ran in the fall of 2018, you'll recall they ran as left of center moderates primarily who were going to work with the administration, work with their Republican colleagues. They were going to solve the problems of the day. They were going to be problem-solving, uh, laser-focused problem-solvers in the House. They've done none of it. So 
I, it's, uh, I think that's going to be something that when you get to the voting booth and people realize that all they did was vote for impeachment, all they did was uh, uh, they didn't work on health care. They didn't work on any of these issues that needed to be done. Uh, and they'll have to answer for that when they get to the ballot box. Of course, they did work in a very bipartisan manner, uh, including with your colleagues, on the stimulus responses to the coronavirus crisis. Uh, they passed three measures. They've got a fourth one ginned up now, which the uh, Republicans in the House and the Senate are um, so far not cooperating with. Right. I, I would disagree with it. I think the uh, first uh, two bills uh, were uh, more uh, uh, bipartisan, if you want to call it that. I think the Senate tried to work in a bipartisan fashion on the CARES Act. Uh, which is the uh, third one, the major piece of legislation. I mean, Mitch McConnell and uh, Chuck Schumer set up five working groups that worked from Friday through Sunday afternoon, and they actually made uh, significant progress until the Speaker of the House came back into town and said no, and then tried to in inject all kinds of hyper-partisan, uh, uh, frankly, uh, socialist uh, agenda stuff from uh, Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, and others that held it up for about a week. And when they, re in, in fact, Larry, uh, the number two uh, guy Cummins in the, in the house uh, told their entire conference Monday of that week, uh, you should look at this as our opportunity to remake America in our vision. That's not uh, bipartisan and it delayed it for about a week. I will give you this, that finally cooler heads prevailed okay. and we got it done. This last one, the HEROES Act, uh, that wasn't bipartisan at all. The HEROES Act was Nancy Pelosi literally putting this bill together without any input from Republicans. And again, uh, she was, uh, I, I would argue, and this is the partisan in me, I would argue that she was hijacked by the most radical uh, left fringe of her conference in some of the things she had to put into that bill. But she's also been quite willing in the past, as you just acknowledged, to make concessions and compromise uh, and shown a willingness to find agreement uh, she's worked very closely with the Treasury Secretary um, Munchen, to find areas where the president agrees and then works with, um, with the uh, Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell. Let me move on to another question, which is a lot of people who don't follow congressional elections are surprised by what it comes down to. It is a math problem. You've got 435 members of the U.S. House of Representatives and the reality is about 90% of them are either fully safe, like you are, you won with 61%, it's, you know, you can, you can run around the country because you're sitting pretty. Uh, and then you've got these other seats, it's 35 to 40, and people differ a little bit, but it's not a large number. How do you go about developing a strategy that will target the math, target the opportunities to win because you know that the vast majority of Democrats are safe. It's not worth your time or your money. So first, I, I uh, guess I, I brush back the idea that no seat is, a, that some seats are never in play. I, I, I disagree with that. I do agree because you never know, Larry, the, the environment, I, you know, now, does that mean that I'm willing to put my uh, uh, betting money on the table on uh, certain seats? No, you're right. Uh, you have to go where the fundamentals of the district tell you that you, uh, you should be playing. Now, 435 seats, uh, you are correct uh, that uh, there are roughly 95 seats that would be considered swing seats. I totally disagree, as you might not be surprised uh, to say, uh, Tom Emmer's in a perfectly safe seat in Minnesota. In my mind, there are no safe seats in okay. Minnesota. Once you, get, once you get outside of Minneapolis and St. Paul, there are no safe seats in Minnesota. In fact, Colin Peterson might be the, the greatest uh, aberration in history since he's in a district that uh, Donald Trump won 60 to 30, and he continues to represent it as he has uh, since the early 1990s. Nonetheless, when, when it comes down to when you meet with your staff and you're talking about where to put your people and your money and your time, you're looking at a fairly limited number of seats. Tell and us I about that. I didn't mean to get away from that. All I wanted to say is it's about work in your district, whether you're Colin Peterson or Tom Emery, it's about work in your district. What we do is this. Uh, so there are 95 swing seats. These are drawn by the states, by the way, as everybody knows. Unfortunately, there's some out there that try to make it sound like Congress is doing this. We look at those 95 seats. And for us, uh, we need uh, 17 seats, as I've told you. So we look, we've targeted 54 seats, Larry. 
the top 30 of those seats, Donald Trump won in 2016. And I told you about the 8.5 million Trump voters uh, that were absent in the fall of 2018. The top 13 of those, Donald Trump won by six points or more, and many of them by double digits. These are ruby red districts that should be Republican districts. Uh, and we've got great candidates. So the next 20, 24, uh, it, with the exception, we'll say the next 20 uh, beyond that 30, those are districts that Hillary Clinton uh, won in the last uh, cycle, but by the slimmest of margins. And if people look, I think there were 115 million total uh, votes cast roughly in the, the last midterm. Uh, if, you, uh, if you go through it, I think somebody gave me a figure of 106,000 votes is what determined the majority in the House. So you can tell just how slim the margin was in those, uh, those 20. Then there are three seats that Republicans have won uh, in the past uh, two or three cycles that we believe are in play. And the last one uh, happens to be in Oregon. This is uh, Peter DeFazio's seat. I think it's Oregon's fourth. Uh, that the president came within, uh, oh, I want to say 600 votes of winning uh, in the last election. It's been trending the Republicans' way. And we, we picked up a, a great candidate, a kid by the name of Alex Scarlatis, who is one of the two uh, American heroes that stopped the terrorist attack on, in Paris on the train a couple of years back. Those are the seats that are in play. Again, we need 17. So let's talk about how you go about winning those seats that are in play. Not the Donald Trump seats. I think both parties would agree those Donald Trump seats, Republicans got the advantage. But then you've got to win more than that. Um, and then you're into this more of a swing district area. What is your strategy? What is the message? What are you trying to do to win, win over those more competitive seats? Well, like I said, you win with great candidates, right? And uh even though he's a friend of mine, I'm going to pick on uh, my new colleague, a uh, great guy, Dean Phillips. Okay. Cause we'll just use a Minnesota example. Uh, Dean's Dean a, Phillips, uh, who's in the democratic what's party. What's that? Dean Phillips is in the democratic party. Right. And, and you were asking me about a swing seat. Uh, yeah. Some might say this isn't a swing seat. I think it is. I th like sure. I said, I think everything in Minnesota with the exception of uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul can at different times, now even the eighth be considered uh, a swing you. seat. Uh, which simply means for people listening and for me, it means that in any given election, giving the right, given the right environment and the right candidate, you get a charismatic candidate, you get the right message. Uh, you know what? You can win. Uh, okay, but let's, get let's go to that message. And, and here's kind of what I'm going at. I've been reading uh, the releases from the National Republican Campaign Committee, and they're pretty tough. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of socialists, uh, um, labels being thrown around. Dean Phillips has, for instance, been labeled a socialist. Um, I don't know if you would actually be believe that. Uh, and I'm just curious, how did we get to the point of labeling all Democrats, not the two, three, or four who are declared socialists, but all Democrats socialists? Well, Larry, as I, first off, uh, God bless Dean, but he's voted 100% of the time with Nancy Pelosi. He's voted 98.3% of the time with his party, and he's voted 94% of the time with Ocasio-Cortez, a self-proclaimed socialist. Uh, so, it, look, the NRCC's job, we are not the, the uh, communications arm for uh, a Republican member of the House or a Republican candidate. Our job is to be that entity that makes it clear who the other person is. Uh, and you know what, when you run on being uh, bipartisan, when you run on being a problem solver, uh, when you're not willing is, and I had this conversation, you can ask Dean, because I do like Dean, I had the conversation with him directly. I said, you know, my grandfather was a Democrat. He told me once that I couldn't be Catholic and be Republican because he was the only kind, loving, compassionate resident of his community because he was the only Democrat. I love the man. We had these debates about the size and scope of government versus the right of an individual to self-determine and where that line is. I think Dean would probably be that way. But as I said to him, when he suggested these are a few small voices, if you're not willing to stand up and speak out, much like this defund the police movement, if you're not willing to get up and go out and go, this is insanity, this is not what we stand for, we've got some things we need to cure, but this is not what Democrats stand for, then you own it. Uh, that's, it's as simple as that. So I'm not, I'm not doing anything, uh, or the committee I should say, because I'm not doing it, the committee is not doing anything unfairly. We are trying to make sure that when a voter goes into the voting booth, they understand the choice that is being made. But, but here's my concern, because 
you know, I, I can understand the criticism of Nancy Pelosi, but she's been against Medicare for all. She's against the, the Green New Deal. She's made it very clear that, that um, AOC is not running the Democratic Party in Congress. I think that's very much part of the record. Um, but when you introduce the phrase socialism and you start labeling candidate socialists, what worries me is the Democratic side, which might conclude we've got to start labeling Republicans racist or fascist or, you know, some other, this is the direction I, I'm, I'm afraid we're ahead down that the discourse becomes so toxic because we're now, you know, labeling Democrats socialists, which obviously they find offensive. And I understand the committee is going to do things to sharpen the choice and help voters understand where Democrats are. And Democrats may conclude, okay, we're playing with sharp elbows. We're going to play that way too. Wow. Does that worry you? Well, Larry, uh, you make it sound as though the Republicans are doing something, uh, have made this up. Uh, I would never do that. The Democrats themselves announced in November, the socialists have arrived. They're the ones that use the term Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Ayanna yeah, Pres No, I get to. I, I want to finish this one because you're making it sound as though we just, out of whole cloth, decided we were going to call somebody something. It is the socialists that have, in fact, got voting cards. They're the ones who call themselves that. They're the ones who have taken over the agenda on the uh, the House uh, Democrat Party. That's the, that's the agenda. There's two members of the House who have declared themselves to be part of the, the, the socialist uh, movement in the, in the United States. We've seen the Democratic leadership make very clear they're not following that direction. I've not seen Dean Phillips or Angie Craig come out and make any statements that would lead you to believe that they're socialists. So, and then you're looking at these four you know, first year representatives. And as you know, in the House, if you are not in the leadership and if you're just starting, you're not calling the shots for anything. Uh, I, I think they disagree with you on that a little bit, but you're talking about for the agenda. When you've got 150 people on government health care signed off, uh, for you to suggest there are two socialists, the, uh, the socialist agenda has been advanced. The, the transportation bill, highly partisan just two days ago, where I think it's uh, two or three out of every five dollars is for part of the socialist agenda. The Green New Deal, as it were, uh, is in the thing. So, Larry... I, it, people, words, uh, people can say whatever they want, but actions uh, speak. And all we're doing is making it clear that this is where you're headed. You talk to some of my, uh, my Democrat friends, and yes, I have many. Uh, they will tell you, as I've, I've talked to one of them in particular in this state, I said, you understand they're not here for us. They're here to clean out my grandfather's Democrat party and remake it in their image. Ocasio-Cortez and that band within the, uh, the uh, Democrat party, they're running primaries against anyone across the country. In fact, Elliot Engel, a great representative from New York and the, uh, the chairman of I the House Foreign making... Affairs Committee probably is gonna lose his primary. Today. But, but you're making my point, which is you've got a small number of socialists who are you know, just starting out their career and they are in battle with the Democratic Party. So, um, so let, let's leave this because clearly we have a little different opinion. Maybe I would just say- That might be for that cup of coffee at Keys. Yeah, I would just say, you know, from a Midwesterner, it worries me and I see you know, loaded phrases like that because the committee starts loading that up and you know the Democratic side is wondering, okay, what can we fire back with? And that's just a rabbit hole I'd rather not see, see us go down. You, you've made your point, but I think, uh, I think I made mine as well. You did. Uh, uh, I've got a lot of questions here from uh, folks in the audience. Um, here's a question from Cheryl Bailey, uh, with a critical election coming up in November in the midst of a pandemic, what legislation do you support to maximize our ability to safely vote? Well, I, I think we're, uh, we're doing it right now. Although I do, I disagree, by the way, uh, I think that's a state issue. I think the state will make the determination and this idea that we should run to the federal government every time and have the uh, feds remake our, uh, our state election system. I, Cheryl, I apologize, but I just disagree with. I think uh, right now there's a major disagreement uh, on the state level as to whether it should be done by mail-in ballots. I mean, uh, we've had it done in both ways in different places. And uh, 
I, I think I'm going to I'm going to defer Larry uh, on Cheryl's question just to tell her that I believe that the state needs to make this determination. And, and we are actually seeing a large number of states, including red states, that uh, entirely use vote by mail and have for some time, like Utah, but also Ohio and and others who are uh, mailing out ballots to registered voters. Um, and it is a state decision. And that is, of course, in the Constitution. Um, here's a question from... Larry, on that, though, before we leave it, before you go to the next one, I think the only issue that our, our states have to really look at is making sure that, because it's this difference between mailing to registered voters versus just mailing to everyone, mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to make sure that we don't have the duplicates and all the rest of it. And I, I again, you're right. I leave that to the states. They're going to have to figure out how they maintain the integrity of the system. Um, here's another question. How do you believe the Republicans can sway voters, particularly suburban voters who are put off by President Trump? Well, I think, uh, I really think that when, uh, in, it's a lifetime when we've been looking at this, right? Uh, February seems like it was years ago uh, in June. So whoever asked the question, uh, please take it with a grain of salt because we're sitting here in June and we're talking about something that's going to be uh, finished in November. A lot can change in a week, let alone uh, a few months. Uh, but I think the two things, one, uh, voters in the suburbs, this is a choice election as opposed to a check election. It, I've heard political scientists, maybe you don't do it, Larry, but I've heard this uh, for a while, that the first midterm is a check on executive power. Uh, and the, uh, the re-election or election is a choice. And the choice that will be made in the ballot box is more complicated than this, but I think... Uh, People will go in and uh, you may not uh, like someone's uh, personality. You may not like their, uh, their behavior, some of their actions, but uh, two primary questions will be asked. One, uh, do I, who can better rebuild the economy? Who will, uh, who, who will do this uh, for me and my family? Donald Trump's done it once already. He can do it again. I believe uh, that will be an advantage to him. Uh, again, barring uh, some new uh, uh, changes. Uh, and then the next one is going to be uh, uh, safety and security. I truly believe that uh, Minnesotans are great about wanting justice. Minnesotans are great about wanting progress, good progress. Uh, and I, I said this to a group this morning that, you know, we're becoming more polarized, but not in fact. You know, as, as a campaign guy, if I put that hat on, they used to talk about the 10% on either edge, Larry. I, I don't think it's 10% anymore. I think we, we've got roughly 55 to 60% that fill this space, and we've got 20 on the outside on either edge, and they're becoming more and more extreme. Uh, there's a purity test, by the way, that changes on a daily basis. I mean, who are my, my the Democrats that uh, I call friends, whoever would have guessed that the purity test would have suddenly become defund the police overnight, right? Seemingly overnight. It happens on the right, too. You pick what your issue is, and boom, all of a sudden, if you don't uh, support that, you alienate this 20%. Then there's 55 to 60 that they either are center left. So, so center getting, right. back, getting back to the question. Well, that's where I was going. Is yeah. those are the people that are going to answer this question. And well, when they know. get there, they're going to ask, who is better in keeping me safe and secure in my community and in my country? And I think that's going to be an advantage to the Republicans. And I notice you're leaving out one issue. What's that? The coronavirus. Uh, there's a question that Gallup has been asking for many years, which is, uh, what's the most important national problem? And it's a shocking result. We're finding that voters are saying the coronavirus is the number one issue, not the economy, not jobs. And on that issue, the president is behind the eight ball. It's almost six out of 10 uh, um, Americans are saying that they're not pleased with how the president has handled this. You've got, you know, the evidence that he did not move quickly and that this led to uh, unfortunate results. Really? Larry, we obviously led, disagree on that. You think he led up the right, he picked up the first memo that came in in January and started action? Larry, when he was cutting off travel, when he was making an incredible uh, a decision that quite frankly, I wondered what we were doing and suddenly uh, uh, stopping travel. Uh, he was called a xenophobe. He was called a racist. I mean, by the very people that are running against him. And, and now, now they say he didn't act quick enough. Well, I think on testing, on, on building up supplies of ventilators, this yeah. is a, a, among nonpartisan types. 
I think there's a consensus that, that we lost a month and maybe more. We lost March uh, and we lost part of April and really ginning things up. Once we understood it, the president knew in January, maybe he could have acted sooner in February. So that's one concern. Then you've got the president you know, recommending ingesting bleach. Then you've got the president you know, talking about this medicine, uh, hydrochloroquine, that's, not, that's now been withdrawn by the FDA in terms of preventing C-19. I'm just listing this because we're gonna see it in plenty of democratic ads about the president and they're responding to the same polls that you're looking at, which yeah. is saying that the coronavirus and the president's handling of it is a dire concern and it's a threat to the country. Well, I think a lot's going to change in the next few months. This uh, pandemic was uh, realized in March. Uh, there hasn't been much time. I think there are a lot of Americans, uh, Larry, that, uh, you know, they started out looking for a savior. Somebody please come save me. Uh, they were fine with these governors uh, shutting down their states. But you know what? The longer it went, and when these elected officials started picking winners and losers, uh, you started to see a division. Some people want to make that a partisan division. I don't. I think there are people who said, I'm smart enough to figure out what I need to do. Just give me the information. I think that as we get stronger, as we get more confident, as we start to understand what we're really dealing with, uh, things are gonna change very quickly. People in America are not gonna live like this. People are not going to live in their basements afraid of something they can't see. Uh, you know, you can spin whatever you want, and I've seen a lot of this, and I'm not going litigate to litigate it with you today. We clearly have a difference of opinion. But again, I told you at the beginning, it's not my job to defend what they're doing. Yeah. They will do whatever they're going to do. And, and, and I think I, my I, job is to make sure my constituents know that I think it's a very serious issue and that we're going to make sure that the vaccine is developed. We're going to make sure that when this happens again, if it ever does, that we're better prepared. And I think if the coronavirus is in fact something that's under control um, and we don't see surges in the fall as we are now in the South, we don't see a second wave that mixes with the flu season, um, you're probably right that the economy is gonna play a larger role. But if in fact we see those uh, you know, scary scenarios that Dr. Fauci and others are warning about as real possibilities, I think we're gonna see voters going back to that issue. Um, Congress member, let me ask you about um, the, um, um, the tremendous protests that obviously started here in Minnesota uh, around the uh, killing of George Floyd. Um, it started in Minneapolis and then it rippled across the country and, and even abroad. Um, I'm curious, what do you make of, of this moment in our state's history and the na nation's history? Uh... I mean, it's it's something that we have to, uh, I didn't expect you to quite ask it that way, Larry. Uh, I think it's incredibly serious, but I think this country is going through one of those growth rings that uh, if you study history, if you go back and look, this isn't unusual. Uh, we, we get to certain moments in time and uh, uh, things tend to boil over for numerous reasons. First, I just say when it comes to George Floyd, uh, as everybody, uh, everybody better recognize that's something that should never happen. That is a tragedy beyond a description. It's something that we should never have to watch, uh, let alone uh, have it happen in the first place. And we need to work to make sure it never happens again. Uh, in general, though, this is something that's been coming for a long time. Uh, you uh, you got to figure out what it means to live in a, uh, a civil society. I, For me, I uh, was in Israel a couple of years back and uh, I sat down with Palestinians and, and I don't mean to equate this, but I give this as a uh, story as an example. Uh, Palestinians uh, and uh, Israelis who were trying to do a, a good thing where they're working together, they're living in the same community. And during this discussion, all of a sudden, one of the young people blurted out, uh, you know, they have our, our land. I shouldn't have to uh, get to the sea by walking across my land and asking permission. And I realized much like I think I'm, I'm trying to work through it now because I think it's much bigger than just saying us and them. I think if you think you can walk into this thing and say, oh, I know what the problem is and I know how to fix it. Uh, I think if you go into it and say, you know, it's, it's not about the color of your skin. It's about, okay, you've got major problems. This thing is a very complex, uh, the community, the people. There's so many things that we have to unpack, Larry. And I think this is going to take us some time 
because it's all coming together as one. And, you know, the, the instant reaction is to say it's all about one thing or two things. It's not. This well, let doesn't me ask happen. you about one. education, Larry, is where I'm going. I, I was just going to stop with, if you are teaching your kids the golden rule, which we got to do that more at home, respect others the way you would expect them to respect you, I think we'll be better off. Let's talk about the problem. Um, clearly, George Floyd's uh, death is uh, something that I think has united Democrats and Republicans in saying this was heinous, it was against the law, it should never happen in the future. But let's broaden that out because I think the problem that, that you're referring to also includes a sense that the criminal justice system, the police, treat whites better than blacks. Do you think that's true? I don't know. I, I, you know what? My, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm having trouble with how you, how you address all the good peace officers that are out there, by the way, who are from many different races. So to just paint with that broad a brush, uh, do I think it happens? Yeah, I think it happens. Uh, I think uh, regardless of uh, someone's, uh, the color of their skin, I think their socioeconomic status. You know, you drive through an affluent suburb, and you're driving an older vehicle that has rust uh, spots on it, and you might uh, have long hair and things hanging out of your ears, you might get pulled over. Uh, and that's probably wrong too. I, I, and I don't mean to minimize it. I think we have to look at uh, making it more personal again, Larry. The, the solution is community policing. I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the thing that we helped create up in St. Cloud. Blair Anderson, the chief of police in St. Cloud is a star. Uh, he called me back when I first got elected to uh, Congress and asked me to help him create something called the cop house, which that's what you have to do is embed peace officers in the community with the people that they're serving. So instead of policing, you're actually working together to keep the community. And of safe. course, that's been a project in Minneapolis for some time, and it's not working as well as I think uh, a lot of people had hoped. Um, well, you need a couple of reforms, though, Larry, two, two major ones. I think one is transparency. When you have a confirmed uh, case of excessive force, right? One that has been substantiated, not an accusation because uh, anybody who wears a uniform, doctors, they get sued all the time. A substantiated claim of excessive force, that has to be documented and it has to be shared with the national database. And it's always gotta be public. You can't hide that stuff, that's one. And the second one, you know, I, I grew up playing uh, uh, hockey right and I, I a coach tries to put the team out and put players in the best position that they can and you're all part of a team but there is seniority everybody knows that the young uh, player has to earn his or her way up to the uh, to get the respect of the older players I, I think the problem that you saw I can't I can't speak for these guys but uh, the officers that were on that call with George Floyd I think we need to have a federal law it's likened to a whistleblower type uh, protection that if you are a junior officer and you're three days out on the street and you need to tell the senior officer you're out of line, you need to be able to do that and be protected. So I, I think you got to at minimum do those things. So, so let's just get back. To, I, I think that's helpful. Let's get back to the problem issue. Um, and I understand your reluctance to single out individual officers. But when you look at the statistics on all sorts of dimensions, uh, African-Americans are being pulled over, they're being arrested, they're, they're, they're uh, experiencing um, uh, you know, more aggressive um, tactics than whites. It's just the fact. Um, and I think there is, you know, what I'm hearing is a very strong sense that in America today, whites are getting ahead more easily than, than blacks. Excuse me. Whites are getting ahead more easily than blacks because of discrimination because of uh, barriers. Um, and that's part of this, this moment that you were describing. Yeah, I, th I think it's more complicated than that. I think that truly is uh, part of it. But this is what I meant earlier. You know, for us just to say it's one or two things, it's, it's more complicated than that. Uh, the education system is, uh, you know, Minnesota, we've thrown so much money at the education system and we still have, if not the greatest achievement gap, we have one of the greatest achievement gaps in the country. I mean, if you're not giving people a real education, you're not giving them access to real opportunities. And what happens is it just starts that downward spiral. And this is, 
that's just as big a factor in my mind, uh, Larry, as uh, the other things that we have come to. In fact, I would argue that's the beginning. I mean, we have to, if we're, if we're going to be honest with this uh, problem, then when we talk about education and, you know, it's when, when we protect the institution over its mission, which is educating our children, uh, we have, uh, we've created a problem. And that's where we're going to have to go back and look at this thing. Uh, this is why uh, I think it was Rudy Perpich uh, created uh, the charter school option, uh, a Democrat, a Democrat. So we need uh, an, an open enrollment, perhaps uh, these different options. So I, I, I hear where you're coming from, but this is what I meant. It's more complicated than that. And we just haven't been giving the, and it, I was just told Crystal Ray in Minneapolis just graduated 40 to 50 students that are college ready and on their way. Why can't we uh, uh, recreate that same experience in our public schools and give people the option to get that education that will give them the opportunities and help them to overcome barriers? Uh, we're back to Tulsa. Uh, question from Kim Nelson. What are African Americans to make of President Trump's choice to hold a rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the scene of some of the most horrific violence perpetrated on black Americans. I was with uh, on a charter with a uh, plane full of uh, black voices for America. Uh, they were uh, uh, asking the president and I, I through uh, the, uh, the representatives, the president was on this charter, he came in on Air Force One, uh, but they, uh, He's he's indicated that he would like to. Uh, he's considering making Juneteenth a. I, I've heard anyway. Nobody better quote me, even though I know this is a public forum. My understanding is he's considering Juneteenth as a uh, national holiday, and they were saying do it, do it. Uh, they they thought it was uh, not only uh, appropriate, uh, but they wished he would have done it a day earlier. The the uh, people I was with. Um, as you know, the budget deficit has continued to grow. Um, I've given talks in your district and elsewhere in Minnesota, and I often hear from Republicans, how is it that the Republicans, particularly in the first two years after Donald Trump was elected, were passing legislation, including tax cuts, that saw the deficit rise by a third in 2017 and 2018. And now, of course, it's over a trillion dollars. What's going on? Why, why haven't Republicans been able to control spending. Well, now there's two different things, obviously, with the pandemic, but let's talk about the other one first and then the pandemic. Uh, first off, I've, I've never, you and I have never agreed on the uh, tax cuts issue. I understand government wants to claim that my money and your money is its money, and therefore, if I get some more of my money back, somehow I've cost government money. I disagree with that. Uh, I, I believe that uh, by giving uh, those tax cuts to middle-class families, uh, it wasn't to major corporations, even though we did cut the corporate tax rate. And by the way, that has reversed the flow of uh, investment back into this country, which just creates more opportunity. I believe that actually uh, generated one of the best economies uh, we've ever seen uh, prior to the pandemic. Now, I, now wait, wait can, I, can I stop you there for a second? Because the Federal Reserve has done analysis. And what they found is that the economy that was chugging along under Barack Obama did not measurably change as a result of those tax cuts. Yeah, I, well, I disagree with you. Okay. I'd love to sit down and have this discussion because a 1.8 GDP in December of 2016 uh, is not uh, three point uh, whatever it was uh, or 2.8 whatever it was, uh, a full point lower. Plus you have to factor in government spending under the, uh, the Obama administration as well. Uh, and how much of that 1.8 was government spending? I've asked, uh, and I've not had the opportunity to get an answer from the current administration either, because they, they don't tell you. It could be 1%. So what is the true uh, uh, private uh, economic growth? But that part aside, Larry, that, that's the, uh, the classroom discussion, that, the debate that we can have about how you make this thing grow uh, and how you actually count dollars. Uh, I I agree with you. I, I think the, uh, the debt is the greatest uh, issue facing our country up until the, uh, the, the CARES Act uh, in the, uh, the first bill. I had not voted to uh, increase spending because I, I believe we have to address it. And the administration has been telling me since they were elected that, uh, look, uh, we have to create a, a booming economy. 
that gets us uh, revenues coming in. Once you do that, that gives us a runway. Then we can start to uh, bring the, uh, the debt back down. For me, Larry, uh, that's great. I've been in public service now uh, for a few years in the state level and now for a few years here at the federal level. Uh, show me a plan. Show me a plan that you're actually going to uh, reduce the uh, deficit because it's one of those things. Uh, I'll gladly uh, I'll pay you $2 on Tuesday if you give me a hamburger today. Uh, no, we're, we're going to know what the plan is and they hadn't done it. This last one, I call this the classic Hobson's choice. You know, I was faced with a, uh, a vote that uh, if it didn't pass, if we voted no and uh, said the uh, debt is more important, it literally could have tanked uh, the U.S. economy. And, uh, you know, some would say, oh, no, no, that wouldn't have happened. Well, I wasn't willing to take that chance on behalf of all the people that I represented. Uh, and I'm willing to uh, take the chance that we kept our economy afloat so that people who are just surviving today can get across this bridge to tomorrow where hopefully we can not only survive, and, but and, we can thrive again. And does it concern you, some of the news reports that came out that uh, a significant amount of the money that you approved was being channeled to large corporations rather than Main Street as was promised? Listen, I, I think that was wrong. I think those corporations have returned much of that in the uh, because they were demanded that it was returned. I also think it's wrong when uh, our colleagues in the House, I mean, I, I was talking to one uh, in Oklahoma City who somebody asked him because of the business he's in, did you take one of these loans? He said, no, I, I would have gotten killed. Well, of course you would have. I mean, that is, unfortunately, that is the double standard, right? Uh, we're voting for it. I, I don't think if, if you've got the business that uh, you're taking it necessarily, I think those problems have been, uh, look, the vast majority of these loans are for $100,000 or less. The vast majority of these loans went to uh, small entities. In fact, the biggest problem I'm hearing about right now, and we are hearing several, you've got to remember, we, we stood up a program in less than two weeks uh, that has done $3 trillion. And here's, here's the one we're getting now. So the forgiveness period has arrived. And I get, a, I get a call about a, uh, a, a lady who owns a candle making business. She took out a $1,000 PPP loan, okay? Uh, guess what? The loan forgiveness paperwork, because they're, they're saying the big corporation that took a half a million dollars and the little candle maker that took a thousand, they gotta do the same paperwork. If that's true, this poor lady is gonna spend more money on attorney's fees to get her forgiveness than the loan, co than the loan gave her. So. Uh, was it perfect? No. Uh, has it done what I think uh, everybody was hoping it did? Yes. Uh, I think the Paycheck Protection Flexibility Act is a wise move, especially for a state like Minnesota, which is why I was a supporter from the beginning. Uh, that 24 weeks as opposed to eight weeks, that's uh, adjusting the 75-25 ratio. I think those were good. Sorry. Uh, uh, two questions here for you. Yes, Last sir. questions. Uh, one is, as you may know, there's some state senators in Minnesota uh, who are going to be calling for Attorney General Barr and the Justice Department in Washington to investigate the Minneapolis Police Department to see if there's a serious pattern and practice of excessive force, bias policing, and other unconstitutional practices by law enforcement. Do you support that? Well, I'll leave that up to the uh, Justice Department, Larry, but uh, I, I do think that uh, if the state senators uh, believe this is something that should be done, I think we should respect their uh, their request. Now, whether that's uh, something, you know, I, I was proud of our Justice Department by putting uh, the George Floyd case as its number one case, like immediately. They didn't even hesitate. They, they, they put it to the top of the list. So I'd be surprised if they weren't already looking at that, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to speak uh, out of turn. Final question, this is uh, from Patricia Hoffman. Mr. Emmer, you have good ideas. However, what do you think about the value of compromise as an important part of a democracy with people that you may disagree with? So compromise, Patricia, has gotten a horrible name for some, uh, some re well, I'll tell you, I think I know why it got a horrible name. Larry, you remember a few years ago, I used to talk about how uh, you know, when Jackie and I got married, Jackie wanted four kids and I wanted three. We compromised. We have seven. Works great in marriage. Works great in marriage. Doesn't work so well in government. And I think our elected officials over the last few decades 
rather than taking compromise, the art of compromise, which is the art of governance. They did it like this. They sat down at a table and they said, if it were Larry and me, Larry, what do you want? Okay, you get everything you want. Tom, what do you want? All right, I, you get everything you want. And guess what? All of the people out there get a whole bunch of things they don't need and they can't pay for. And so we do have to get back to the art of compromise, which is I know what my political perspective is. Larry knows what his is. Uh, they might be the same on some issues. They might be somewhat different on other issues. When we reach those ones that are different, we got to sit down as colleagues and work through the difficult thing of, hey, what can I live with and what can you live with? What can the people we work for, the people that hired us, what can they live with? What's the best decision that you can make for everybody? That's an art of governance, which we have lost in this country, and we've got to get it back. Congressman Tom Emmer, once again, thank you very much. And uh, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, I appreciate your, your spirit in this and, um, and uh, your willingness to sit down and chat with us. Thank you very much. You're a good man, Larry Jacobs, and thanks to everybody who's on here. Let's just remember at the end of the day, we're all Minnesotans and we're all Americans, first and foremost. Here, here. Thanks. I'm going to do a couple last minute uh, uh, thank yous. If you need to sign off and run to your next meeting, I understand. Thanks again. I uh, want to just uh, give you a heads up. Uh, we've got some remarkable programs coming up. On June 30th, we have the Minnesota Paradox with uh, Professor Sam Myers and Joe Sauce from the Humphrey School and Dr. Meikau Hang, who's at uh, University of St. Thomas. If you're interested in the issue about uh, economic inequality in Minneapolis, this is gonna be an extraordinary program. That's June 30th at 11 a.m. Then we've got another extraordinary program with David Axelrod, Barack Obama's uh, political guru, and Vin Weber, longtime uh, Minnesotan Republican strategist, and that'll be July 9th at noon. And then we're gonna have a very interesting program with Peter Weiner, uh, who's a well-known uh, conservative, and David Hopkins, who's a scholar. And that will be Wednesday, uh, July 29th at noon. If you find this program interesting, I wanna let you know that it'll be uh, available online, it'll be recorded. It has been recorded on a day or two. Um, and many of our other programs, um, both during the coronavirus and before are also available. Before I leave, I wanna give a quick shout out to the people who made this possible. Kristen Fabin, thank you very much. Uh, Mike Kari, uh, who did all the, the tech work and the scheduling, thank you, Mike. And uh, Kate Semino, who was our quarterback today in running everything. To all of you, thank you for joining us and have a good day. Thank you.